Hello everyone, my name is Christopher Haddlesey and I'm the Communications Coordinator of Parkinson Society Ontario. With me today is Mark Carpenter, Associate Professor, Canada Research Chair, School of Kinesiology and University of British Columbia. Today Mark will be presenting on the topic of uncovering the origins of balance problems in Parkinson's disease. Mark's work is made possible thanks to Porridge for Parkinson's Toronto Pilot Project Grant of $45,000. This money is raised by the Porridge for Parkinson's event, and the next one is taking place on November 8th. Be sure to check out our website for more details. Please be sure to hold all your questions until the end of the webinar, at which point you may type them into the bottom right corner. Now, without further ado, please begin when you are ready, Mark. Well, first, I would like to thank the Parkinson Society of Canada for inviting me to speak today, and especially all of you that have taken your time to tune in to participate in this presentation. As this is my first webinar, I, I look forward to this opportunity uh, for exchange and to share some of my knowledge about current research methods and discoveries on postural instability and falls in Parkinson's disease. And I look forward to trying to answer some of your questions at the end of the session. I'd like to begin by telling you a little bit about my own background. Uh, I have a PhD in kinesiology, and I specialize in the neural control of human posture and movement. My research at the University of British Columbia focuses on how the brain and nervous system controls human balance and the factors that may contribute to balance disorders and falls. Through my PhD, I worked with a neurologist in the Netherlands, Dr. Bastian Bloom, and a professor in Switzerland, Dr. Uh, John Allen, to study different aspects of balance deficits in Parkinson's disease. And I've now carried on this work at the University of British Columbia in collaboration with Dr. Martin McEwen and others at the Pacific Parkinson Research Center here in Vancouver. I've been fortunate to have been funded for some of this work through the Parkinson Society of Canada, and I'll discuss some of the research projects uh, that we're currently working on towards the end of the presentation. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Mark. Try pulling back a little bit from the mic. Apparently, some people are getting a bit of an echo. Oh, okay. Is this a little better? Hopefully, keep going. Okay. So just a brief overview of my presentation today. First, I will discuss some of the current data around falls on Parkinson's disease and the risk factors that are associated with increased falls. Uh, next, I'll review some of the current methods used to assess postural instability and their strengths and limitations. We will then discuss some of the known effects of Parkinson's disease on postural control and review the current evidence for treatment effectiveness on improving postural instability in Parkinson's disease. I'll present some evidence for a non-dopaminergic origin of balance problems with PD and then review the current research using brain imaging techniques to identify the potential neural origins of balance and problems in Parkinson's. Finally, I'll discuss some of the new research that we are engaged in through the support of the Parkinson Society of Canada to gain new insights into the origins of balance problems in Parkinson's disease. To start, I'd like to have a very brief review of the neural circuitry involved in Parkinson's disease. And as I'm sure you know, Parkinson's disease involves the degeneration of dopamine produced uh, within the substantia nigra, and this is shown in the figure here in the left in the brainstem. Um, the substantia nigra is part of a collection of nuclei that together form the basal ganglia within the brain. As shown in the figure on the right, the basal ganglia nuclei, which are shown here in this red box, receive inputs from the cortex and forms important parallel loops that project back to the cortex to help modulate motor and non-motor functions. It also has descending pathways that likely contribute to the control of locomotion and balance. So dopamine produced in the substantia nigra plays an important role in regulating the function of the basal ganglia and thus the loss of the dopaminergic cells with Parkinson's disease leads to basal ganglia dysfunction and a wide variety of motor and non-motor symptoms. There are four hallmark symptoms of motor deficits in Parkinson's disease. These include slowness or bradykinesia, stiffness, resting tremor, 
and the final symptom is postural instability and falls. Now, unlike the other hallmark symptoms, postural instability and in falls is typically associated with the late, later stages of Parkinson's disease. As such, postural instability has become an important clinical marker for classifying the later stages of the disease. For example, the Hone and Yar scale, which is a widely used clinical scale to assess the severity of Parkinson's disease symptoms, distinguishes a Hone and Yar stage two and a Hone and Yar stage three, where you see there are now bilateral symptoms with postural instability. Later stages are then distinguished based on the severity and the progression of balance and gait disabilities, which culminates in stage five with a loss of mobility and the requirement for assistive devices to walk and balance. Falls are clearly a major problem in Parkinson's disease. A number of studies have focused on assessing the frequency of falls in Parkinson's disease. Most fall assessments rely on retrospective data in which individuals are asked to report the number of falls they have had previously. The difficulty with retrospective data is that it relies on memory of past falls, sometimes over a long period of time, which has been shown to have poor reliability. Prospective data, on the other hand, establishes a baseline and then tracks the frequency of any future falls from that point in time. Using techniques such as fall diaries and follow-up interviews, the prospective fall data provides a more reliable measure of falls and their features over a defined period of time. Based on a meta-analysis, which groups the re results from six independent prospective fall studies, it was found that over a three-month period, an average of 46% of individuals with Parkinson's disease reported a fall with a confidence interval that ranged between 38 to 54 percent. Of those that reported a fall in this period, an average of 21 percent had no prior history of falls. When compared to age-matched healthy controls, Parkinson's disease subjects were on average three times more likely to fall than uh, their controls suggesting that the balance problems with Parkinson's disease are independent from the normal uh, changes with aging. There's a clear relationship between the likelihood of falls and the duration of the disease. The graph here uh, was based on a large study in Sydney which was a multi-center study which followed Parkinson's disease patients for 20 years from the time they were diagnosed. Time zero on the left of the graph is the time of diagnosis. So this point here. With one representing the ratio of patients without any of the symptoms at the time of the diagnosis. Now the occurrence of a first fall is shown in this graph as the dark solid line which changes over time. So it's this line here. As shown, the number of patients experiencing their first fall grows steadily with time, such that by 10 years, approximately 50% of all subjects have experienced their first fall. And after 20 years, of those that are still surviving, 87% of those have suffered at least one fall. Now it should be noted that these falls occur even though the patients are being treated optimally for their other Parkinson's disease symptoms throughout the course of the study. However, what is also becoming apparent is that postural instability is not limited to the later stages of Parkinson's disease. And there are some cases when postural instability occurs at much earlier stages of the disease. Based on the long-term prospective study I referred to in the previous slide, there was evidence of postural instability within 34% of Parkinson's disease patients within the first two years after their initial diagnosis. Another study by Voss et al. in 2012 
reported 23% of Parkinson's disease patients in their study had experienced a fall within the first five years of their initial diagnosis. These rates of falling in the early stages of the disease can also be seen if we refer back to the graph from the previous slide, which is shown here in the bottom, where the occurrence of first falls is reported in the first five years in approximately 20% of the Parkinson's disease patients. So this is an issue that also occurs in some subjects in early stages of the disease. In addition to the larger number of falls in Parkinson's disease, the circumstances that lead to falls are also specific to Parkinson's. In a prospective study by Blum et al. in 2001, they had individuals report the situations and causes of their falls. One key feature of falls in Parkinson's disease is the high number that occurs indoors, with over 80% of falls occurring indoors for Parkinson's compared to a very low percentage of those that are falls in healthy controls. The other distinguishing feature is that the majority of falls were due to intrinsic causes, and these are issues related to problems with the individual's movements, such as when they're turning or stopping or initiating a movement, as opposed to the extrinsic factors which are caused by disturbances in the environment, and these are much lower causes in Parkinson's disease. There are a number of negative outcomes associated with falls in Parkinson's disease. The most serious is the high rates of fall-related injuries that are suffered, with between 24 and 39 percent of reported falls resulting in a significant injury, which is higher than the age match control rates. Other negative results of falls include an increased fear of falling, which is strongly linked to future falls, a decreased quality of life, and restricted physical activity and isolation as they try to avoid situations and activities that are perceived to increase the risk of future falls. One goal of research is to try and identify factors that can help to predict the likelihood or risk of falls in patients with Parkinson's disease. With a wide range of risk factors that have been reported, there are only a few that have been consistently shown to be related to future falls across studies. The most significant predictor of future falls is a history of prior falls. And this is really not surprising, as falls tend to be recurrent. And while an important factor to consider, it is often uh, limited predictive value when the, recollection, when the recollection of prior falls is unreliable, and it cannot be used to predict the very first fall. Another factor shown to be a strong predictor of future falls in Parkinson's disease is a fear of falling. Evidence has shown a strong relationship between fear and balanced symptoms in Parkinson's. This is highlighted in the graph by Adkin et al. in 2003, which is shown in the bottom of this slide, where balanced confidence is shown to be highly related to balanced symptoms on the UPDRS motor subscale. This has led to a new focus of research, including work in my own lab, that aims to understand how fear may influence balance control and contribute to future falls. While some studies have shown relationships between measures of postural instability in falls, the evidence is somewhat mixed and likely depends upon the types of measures used to characterize postural control. Given the wide range of measures that are used, I think it's important to review some of the key types of balance uh, measures used for clinical and research purposes and consider their relative strengths and limitations. So one of the most commonly used clinical tests for balance instability in Parkinson's disease is the retropulsion test, which is otherwise called the pull test. In this test, the clinician stands behind the patient and rapidly pulls on the shoulders towards them to cause a perturbation to balance. The pull test is positive if the person takes more than two steps backwards or would fall if not caught by the tester. Note that the retropulsion test is part of a larger battery of the United Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, or UPDRS, motor scale, 
and while it has good clinical utility, it has a number of limitations, especially as subjects become accustomed to the task uh, when it is repeated over time. And this is shown in the figure by Bloom et al. in 2001, here, um, where the UPDR score for the retropulsion test is shown to change over repeated trials in the same subject. Both patients and controls have some difficulties on the first unexpected test, while the difference between groups varied with uh, repeated experience. So while it may be a good test to identify large postural deficits, it is a less useful as a tool to detect more subtle changes in postural control. And most studies have found poor relationships between the retropulsion test and falls. Other clinical tests of balance re rely on qualitative and quantitative assessments of a patient's performance over a series of different balance and gait tasks. These test batteries have different names, including but not limited to the Tinetti Mobility Test, the Berg Balance Scale, Mini Best Scale, and the Community Balance and Mobility Scale. And all of them involve a combination of different tasks that are performed and assessed by the clinician. For example, as you see on the right, for the Berg Balance Scale, a patient is rated on performance of standing in different foot positions with the eyes open or the eyes closed and changing between different postures or turning. These types of clinical tests are very useful when trying to identify global changes in balance and gait ability. However, they do not provide insight into how uh, postural instability is changed specifically and are usually not found to be useful, again, in predicting for future falls. Unlike clinical methods, which rely on subjective assessment of uh, the quality of movement and general performance measures, posturography involves the use of quantitative measures to record subtle changes in the way balance is controlled under static and dynamic conditions. Static posturography quantifies how balance is controlled during quiet, undisturbed standing. It uses techniques to measure how the body moves in space when trying to maintain a static or stable position during quiet stance. Even when trying to stand perfectly still, your body continues to sway and the level and pattern of sway uh, has been shown to be indicative of different changes in postural control and balance deficits. Dynamic posturography examines how the body responds to dynamic changes in the postural environment. This involves dynamic changes to balance introduced by our own voluntary movements and also dynamic perturbations to balance that may be caused by external factors such as a push or the movement of the ground underneath our feet. Now, Static posturography is the measure of body sway and how it's controlled during quiet stance. Uh, while we stand quietly, we're constantly swaying backwards and forwards and side to side, even when we concentrate on minimizing this movement. During quiet stance, the movement of the body is, in, is usually modeled as an inverted pendulum, as we can see here, um, which means that it treats the body as a, a large mass which sways on a fixed rod around a single joint, which is at the ankle joint. In this case, we consider the controlled variable to be the estimate of the center of mass, which is the center of the mass of the body as it sways back and forth. And the center of mass can be estimated from sensors that are placed on the body to track all of the body movements or a single sensor that's placed usually at the level of the trunk. The forces required to control the center of mass can be measured using a force plate, which you can see the person standing on here. And this is underneath the feet and calculates a center of pressure of all the forces that are exerted underneath the feet to control balance. If we examine the movements of the center of mass during a period of quiet stance, as you can see in the middle graph here, we would see a plot that looks somewhat like a plate of spaghetti, which was the small, slow movement of the center of mass swaying around over time in all directions. Now, a similar pattern would be observed um, under the feet with the forces recorded from the force plate. And this is because those forces are acting to corral the center of mass and keep it within the base of support. 
If we take the movements from the center of pressure and the center of mass in a single direction, for example, in the forward-backward direction, as you see in the far right graph, the center of pressure nicely tracks and follows the center of mass over time. Now, different characteristics of the sway behavior can then be calculated. For example, the amplitude of the sway uh, or the frequency of the sway changes uh, and compared across subjects and conditions. Now, a large number of studies have used static posturography to quantify balance deficits in Parkinson's disease. However, because of the wide range of methods and parameters used across experiments, there is some inconsistency within the literature. If we limit the experiments to those that use a recommended duration of at least 60 seconds and included an age match control, there are some consistent patterns of balance changes that emerge across studies. In most cases, the amplitude of center of pressure and center of mass sway during quiet stance is significantly larger in patients with Parkinson's disease. Now, this is illustrated in the figure by Mancini et al. With center of pressure displacement shown on the left of the graph and center of mass on the right. Compared to the healthy control subject, which is shown at the top, the Parkinson's disease patient with a mild untreated a disease shown in the middle graph has significantly larger center of pressure and center of mass displacements. And the subject with a moderate untreated Parkinson's disease on the bottom part of the graph shows even larger sway, which is most pronounced in the medial lateral or side to side direction. In addition to increased amplitudes, the frequency and the speed of those displacements of sway is also increased with Parkinson's disease, and this is found even when controlling for frequencies introduced by tremor. Now, dynamic posturography examines the dynamic balance responses to an unexpected or expected disturbance to balance. Most commonly, research focuses on external perturbations to balance that require a postural reaction to recover for a fall. In the laboratory, we use perturbations that mimic the types of disturbances you may encounter in everyday life. On the left is a device called a watt jerk that has been developed at the University of Waterloo to deliver a mechanical push or pull to the upper body as you might experience when you're bumped in a crowd. In the middle is a picture of a translating platform in my own lab that can slide up to one meter in the forward or backward direction or side to side depending on how the body is oriented. The translation of the platform is designed to mimic the types of perturbations you may experience when standing on an accelerating bus or subway. The picture on the right is an example of a rotating platform used in my lab. This platform can rotate the feet around the ankles and provide the kind of perturbations you may experience when standing on a rotating surface such as a tilting boat or a, de a dock. The advantage of using these types of devices is that the perturbations are highly controlled and repeatable, which allows the experimenter to compare postural reactions across groups and under different conditions. Now on the left is an example of a patient standing on a rotating platform that is tilted sideways beneath his feet. A number of different measurement tools are used to quantify his postural reaction to the perturbation. As shown in the bottom middle picture, the force plates built into the support surface can provide insight into how the forces generated beneath the feet are used to stop and correct the platform-induced movement. As shown in the middle figure, electrodes can be placed over the muscles on the legs, the trunk, and the arms, and they're used to record electrical activity that's generated by contracting muscles, which is a method known as electromyography, or EMG. Muscle activity can involve simple spinal reflexes that respond to the rapid rotation of the joints, which is shown in the top um, muscle responses here in number one and two, or a later balance correcting response initiated in muscles to restabilize the body. Now the actual body movements during the perturbation can be recorded using motion analysis systems. Now, motion analysis uses special markers placed on the skin that reflect or transmit infrared light that can be seen by special cameras to record the three-dimensional movements of the body in space. 
And these markers can be used to calculate accurate movements of the body segments and recreate how the person uh, responds to the perturbation. Across the many studies that have examined posture reactions in Parkinson's disease, there are a number of consistent findings. The first common finding is that patients with Parkinson's disease have a significantly larger amplitude response in their muscles compared to healthy controls. The excessively large responses can be seen uh, in the medium latency stretch responses and also in the later balancing correcting responses in the same muscles. Um, now this can be seen clearly in the figure shown on the right with the Parkinson's disease responses shown in black and the control subject shown in gray. The excessive muscle reactions in Parkinson's disease leads to co-contraction and stiffness. A co-contraction occurs when muscles on both sides of the same joint are active at the same time and thus prevent smooth movement of the joint. The co-contraction is clearly observed in this figure on the top, which illustrates the muscle responses to a backward translation of the support surface in a healthy control, which is shown on the left, and a Parkinson's disease patient, which is shown on the right. The figure shows pairs of muscles around the ankle, the knee, and the hip, with muscles on the back of the body always shown as the top trace, and muscles on the on the opposite side shown in the bottom downward facing traces. Now in the elderly control subject, a backwards translation normally elicits responses in muscles along the back side of the body. So this includes the calf muscles, the hamstrings, and the back muscles, which are shown in the dark black filled areas here. Note that there's little activity on the opposite muscles, um, which are in the inverted traces. In contrast, the subject with Parkinson's disease has similar but larger responses in the muscles along the back side of the body, but they also have significant activity in muscles on the front side of the body, which leads to stiffening and co-contraction. The stiffening and co-contraction has a significant biomechanical outcome that makes Parkinson's disease patients more prone to falling. So as shown here in the bottom figure, the strategies between healthy controls and Parkinson's disease subjects are very different for a same perturbation. So in response to a sideward tilt of the platform, an elderly subject moves the trunk in the opposite uphill direction to counteract the movement and raises the downward arm in the direction of the fall. In contrast, the Parkinson's disease subject remains stiff across the hip joint and thus falls as a single segment or like a log toward the direction of the tilt. Adding further to the problem is the lack of arm responses that you would otherwise be used to break a fall. And this may explain the relatively low number of risk fact, uh, wrist fractures and high hip fractures that are report, reported in Parkinson's disease patients compared to control subjects. The third effect of Parkinson's disease on dynamic balance is a lack of adaptation to changing postural demands which is also called postural inflexibility. In these cases, healthy controls are able to make quick adaptations to a new context or postural set, whereas patients with Parkinson's disease seem unable or slow to make the necessary adjustments. For example, when changing from perturbation of one known amplitude to another, control subjects are able to adjust their postural response appropriately. In, co in contrast, Parkinson's disease patients will respond with the same muscle response amplitude for both small and large perturbations. Likewise, studies have shown that Parkinson's disease patients have difficulty changing between types of perturbations, for example, when following a series of translations with an expected rotation of the support surface. Third, Parkinson's disease patients are unable to adapt to demands of different postures. For example, in the figure shown, a control subject shown on the top half of the graph has a set of normal posture responses to a support surface rotation in the legs and the hip muscles. And this is shown here on the left. However, when they're able to grasp a bar and which provides stability during the perturbations, they will minimize the posture response in their leg muscles. In contrast, if we look at the Parkinson's subject on the bottom part of this graph, we see the same 
but larger response to the perturbation when freely standing. And when they are able to hold a stabilizing bar, they still respond with posture responses in the leg muscles. So they don't adapt to the situation as is done with the healthy control. Therefore, there appears to be significant changes in dynamic balance responses that can be potential precursors to falls. Now, given the extent to which Parkinson's disease affects both static and dynamic balance, the key question is how do these symptoms respond to typical drug and surgical treatments for Parkinson's disease? Unfortunately, the results generally suggest that postural deficits in Parkinson's disease show little improvement with either medication or surgical treatment such as DBS or deep brain stimulation uh, in the sub subthalamic nucleus or globus pallidus internus. The lack of improvement in static balance is illustrated in the graph on the left. As shown on the left side, a patient before surgery has even greater sway amplitudes when they are on levodopa compared to when they're off levodopa. The subject on the top is someone who is then treated with deep brain stimulation of the globus pallidus internus. In this case, there seems to be some improvement of sway following the surgery. However, in the second patient on the bottom of the figure that receives deep brain stimulation in the subthalamic nucleus, there's no noticeable improvement in sway post-surgery. Likewise, for dynamic responses, while some improvement is shown with deep brain stimulation in some studies. In general, the results do not support significant improvement over the long term. As shown in this figure, a larger displacement of the center of mass following a perturbation in Parkinson patients is shown off stimulation in the solid black line compared to the dotted line, which is the controls. And after deep brain surgery, there is very little improvement that's seen uh, during these dynamic responses. Therefore, researchers have begun to question the classic model of Parkinson's disease and consider where, whether there are po other possible origins for balance instability in Parkinson's. The lack of any significant improvement with postural instability with treatments that target the dopamine system is one argument for a non-dopaminergic origin. However, more direct evidence comes from studies that examine the presence of postural instability in different experimental models of Parkinson's disease. For example, as shown in the figure by Mueller and Bonin, 2013, animal models with a pure dopaminergic loss caused by a drug called MPTP that had an isolated effect on dopamine neurons shows no signs of postural instability. In contrast, animals that have lesions isolated to both dopamine and cholinergic neurons, shown in the middle, or just cholinergic neurons, shown in the bottom, both show postural deficits. So these results have now led researchers to consider cholinergic pathways as an alternative origin for posture and gait deficits in Parkinson's. It is now known that Parkinson's disease affects other neurons besides just dopaminergic neurons. One other type of neurons that degenerate with Parkinson's disease are cholinergic neurons that produce the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. These neurons project throughout the brain and are thought to explain a number of non-motor and cognitive symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease. As shown in the figure, a PET image of a healthy control subject on the bottom of the two images shows widespread projections of acetylcholine that is targeted especially in regions of the thalamus, which is shown here, and in the brainstem. In contrast, there's a marked reduction in acetylcholine in the Parkinson's disease patient depicted in the top two images, which is consistent with widespread denervation of cholinergic neurons. One of the key areas in the brain that contains cholinergic neurons is found in the brainstem and is called the pedunculopontine nucleus, shown with the green arrow. Now, the PPN, or pedunculopontine nucleus, 
is part of a larger locomotor region called the MLR. As you can see in the figure, the, the PPN has unique connections with the basal ganglia, both through the substantia nigra, here, and also through the thalamus, which will connect to the cortex. It also has strong connections to brainstem nuclei, such as the reticular formation, and other descending motor pathways to the spinal cord that are involved in muscle control. Because of its connections with brainstem pathways controlling skeletal muscle, the PPN and larger locomotor regions are considered as important for controlling balance and gait. As such, it is hypothesized that cholinergic loss due to Parkinson's disease may lead to decreased PPN function and deficits in balance and gait, including freezing. As shown in the image on the slide, there is a significant concentration of cholinergic neurons that have been stained in the PPN region of a healthy control subject, which is shown here on the far left. Uh, in the middle, there's a reduction of these stained cholinergic neurons in an individual with Parkinson's disease that is a non-faller or has no history of falls. And on the right, there is even greater loss of these neurons in the patient with a history of falling. Now, the relationship between the amount of cholinergic cell loss in the PPN and falls can be shown in the larger graph in a study by Karachi et al. in 2010. In the graph, it's shown uh, the total number of cholinergic cell loss uh, and in the three different groups and you can see that the greatest cell loss is found in the faller group of Parkinson's disease with slightly less loss in the, the non-fallers compared to controls. So there seems to be a relationship between uh, cholinergic loss in the PPN and the presence of falls. Research continues to search for new evidence to support potential sites of origins for balance problems in Parkinson's disease. And one of the main roadblocks is that the specific neural structures involved in controlling even healthy, normal balance are still poorly understood, let alone trying to identify the key structures that are involved in postural instability in Parkinson's disease. Studies that try to focus on understanding the neural regions and pathways that control balance use imaging techniques to try and observe brain activity while subjects perform balanced tasks in real time. And there are a number of techniques that can be used and each has its own strengths and limitations. Now EEG, which stands for electroencephalography, and MEG, which stands for magnetoencephalography, use electrodes placed on the scalp to record brain activity uh, through changes in electrical and magnetic signals respectively. The benefit of using EEG and MEG is that they can be worn while subjects move freely uh, during balancing gait tasks, and they can record events that happen over very short periods of time. The disadvantage of these techniques is that they're limited to recording primarily brain areas on the outer superficial surface of the brain, and not the deeper structures found in the center of the brain, such as the basal ganglia or the brainstem. Now, other techniques, such as PET, which stands for positron emission tomography, or fMRI, which stands for functional magnetic resonance imaging, use large machines that can scan blood flow changes that occur in regions of the brains that are active during certain tasks. So the advantage of PET and fMRI is that they can accurately detect changes in all brain regions, including the deeper brain structures in the brainstem. However, they cannot detect changes that happen over very short time periods. There are a number of challenges to using PET and fMRI when trying to measure brain activity during balance. First, most scanners require subjects to lie down, although there are a few PET scanners which allow subjects to be seated or standing. And obviously, this makes it difficult to study balance. In all cases, the head must be kept in a fixed position. And as a result, studies in, of balance that use PET or fMRI are limited to those in which subjects are standing with their head fixed or they more often are lying down in the scanner and have to use imagery of themselves performing balance during the scanning. In the following few slides I'd like to review the small collection of studies that have investigated brain activity patterns during balance-like tasks in either a PET or an fMRI machine. 
As you will see, the findings are highly dependent on the methods that are used. So first, there's been two studies that have been done to examine balance while standing in an upright PET machine. One study was performed in young adults and the other in older adults. Both experiments involved quiet standing with the head fixed in the scanner and was compared to a task of lying with the eyes open. Both studies demonstrated that during the balanced task compared to the lying task, there is an increased brain activity in the cerebellum and visual areas and decreased activation in the frontal motor areas. So note that these areas are not directly implicated in Parkinson's disease. The majority of studies have used motor imagery of balanced tasks, and motor imagery requires the subject to imagine themselves engaged in performing the balanced task without actually performing the task. So for example, subjects are asked to imagine standing quietly even though they are lying in the scanner. At least five studies have been performed to examine brain activity during the motor imagery of quiet stance in both young and older adults. When limiting the focus, to those three studies that used a control condition that included motor imagery, a distinct pattern of brain activity emerges across these studies. Motor imagery of balance compared to lying was associated with increased brain activity in the basal ganglia, in the thalamus, in the th cerebellum, and the brainstem regions including the pons and the midbrain. And of note, the majority of these areas with the exception of the cerebellum, are either directly or indirectly influenced by Parkinson's. Now, two studies have used motor imagery to examine brain activity during more dynamic tasks. In one study that controlled for motor imagery at rest, the results showed significant increases in activity during motor imagery of a dynamic task, again in the basal ganglia and in the thalamus, increases in the cerebellum and brain regions in the pons and the PPN region. And note again that these are the same areas that were activated during the quiet standing tasks and thus raises some concern about the specificity of results for different tasks using motor imagery. Now it's important to note that there have been no imaging studies uh, during dynamic tasks, motor imagery or otherwise, performed in older adults. Uh, and furthermore, to date, there have been no published studies using imaging to study balance of any kind in Parkinson's disease. And this is a striking gap in the literature that is only recently being addressed. Now, one current study is ongoing to look at motor imagery during dynamic tasks in both older adults and patients with Parkinson's disease. And the preliminary results based on nine Parkinson's subjects and 10 age match controls was recently presented at a Congress in June. The study required subjects to use motor imagery to imagine themselves rocking back and forth on an unstable rocker board in order to move a laser pointer between two targets. And this was compared uh, with gait tasks and also quiet tasks. Now the results, although preliminary, are very exciting as they identify key regions within the locomotor region of the brainstem where the PPN is located. More importantly, there appear to be separate regions within this locomotor area that are activated uh, by balance and by gait. So balanced tasks have an increased activation in the ventral lateral region, which is the front side region shown in red on the brain image here. Um, in contrast, the gait is associated with increased activity in the dorsal medial region, which is shown here in blue. So the presence of distinct regions for dynamic balance and gait control is promising as it suggests new potential targets for treatments of those with predominant gait versus balance problems. So while important insights have been gained using uh, motor imagery studies, there are a number of limitations for using motor imagery to study balance in Parkinson's disease. Uh, first, the ability to perform motor imagery is highly variable, especially in older adults and those with Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease, are show, patients are shown to use different motor imagery strategies than controls. So these are issues because brain activation patterns differ depending on the ability to use motor imagery and the strategies that are used. Furthermore, there is a very poor overlap of brain activity observed during the motor imagery of a task 
compared to actual performance of that task. And, and therefore, important neural regions involved in actual balance may be missed using motor imagery. Therefore, my collaborators and I have undertaken a project to discover a novel fMRI approach to investigating the pathophysiology of postural instability in Parkinson's disease. This project was recently funded by the Parkinson's Society of Canada with a Porridge for Parkinson's Toronto pilot project grant. We're very grateful for the support of the Parkinson Society of Canada and its, fundraisers, and its fundraisers as it provided the opportunity to pursue this pilot project that we hope will yield important new evidence to understanding the origins of postural instability in Parkinson's disease. The aims of the project are to develop a balanced simulator that can be controlled while lying, while lying in a brain imaging machine and validate balance simulated uh, versus actual balance performance. And finally, we wish to then use the simulator in an fMRI to examine the effects of Parkinson's disease and hopefully discover new areas that are controlling balance. Now, the simulator is designed to allow the subject to control an inverted pendulum that has the same balance requirements as a standing body. By aligning the feet with the axis of the pendulum, the subject can balance and maintain equilibrium of this free swaying system in much the same way as if they were standing and balancing themselves. The advantage of using the simulator is that although the subject is lying down, uh, they are engaged in a real balancing task that requires actual activation of the muscles and normal sensory feedback received through the skin and stretch receptors in the leg muscles. So by linking a visual display, the actual movement of the simulator uh, can be projected back to the subject so they can also have a visual feedback as well. As shown in the figures, the preliminary results are extremely promising in support of the balanced simulator being able to replicate the same types of sway behavior that are experienced in actual balance. The figure shows data from a single subject over a 60 second trial of standing with the eyes open. The light gray line is the sway of the subject's trunk during an actual quiet standing task. The dark line represents almost identical sway behavior of the same subject lying in the balance simulator with visual feedback provided through a screen. As you can see, there's similar patterns in the sway in terms of the size or amplitude of the sway and also the, the, the frequency of the sway uh, while the subject is performing these tasks. More promising is that the typical deficits of Parkinson's disease in standing are also observed when they are performing balance in the simulator. So our results showed a typical pattern of increased sway amplitude in Parkinson's disease, which here are shown in the red bars, compared to controls during quiet stance, which is shown here. So Parkinson's disease subjects, as we'd expect, have larger sway during normal stance compared to controls. And when they're in the balance simulator, we see this similar pattern with larger sway of simulated balance in Parkinson's disease patients compared to controls. Likewise, the frequency of sway that we see during actual balance is represented in the sway during tasks in the balance simulator. The next step is now to take the simulator into an fMRI machine to allow subjects to engage in simulated balance tasks while undergoing brain imaging. The task we will use in the scanner will involve quiet standing tasks, and dynamic responses to perturbations to the simulator um, that will be unexpected. We also will involve some non-balanced tasks to confirm that these changes are not due to proprioception but are in fact changes due to balance control. And the hope is that these studies may reveal important regions involved in controlling both static and dynamic balance and potential areas where Parkinson's disease may show deficits. And by identifying new neural areas, we hope we can open up new potential targets for treatments and interventions and gain new insights into how Parkinson's disease may influence balance. At this point, uh, I'd like to conclude my presentation uh, by gratefully thanking my funding supporters, uh, especially the Parkinson's Society of Canada, 
and many collaborators that have contributed to my past and present research involving balance and Parkinson's disease. And I, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. I'll do my very best to answer your questions. However, uh, I'd like to highlight that I am not a clinician and therefore I'm not able to address any questions that may pertain to your medical treatment or clinical aspects of the disease. Thank you. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the bottom right corner. So Mark, the first one is, um, would the wobble board exercise daily help with uh, balance? So there has been a number of studies that have focused on the effect of targeted balance training for improving postural control. Um, there are some positive results to suggesting that targeted dynamic balance training does improve postural ability. Um, and therefore, I think those types of treatments are certainly effective in improving balance under different dynamic conditions. Um, there is no clear evidence to suggest that although balance training may improve balance ability, it will reduce future falls, um, but that relies on uh, more work to, to confirm that. So there certainly is evidence to suggest that targeted balance training will have improvements in balance. Question. Any information on impact of LSVT therapy on posture stability? Uh, I have to admit, I, I don't have any information on that or, or, or I'm aware of any, uh, any studies on that at the moment. Seems to be the end of the questions. I want to thank everyone for attending and special thanks to Mark for taking the time to be here with us today. I will be uploading the webinar to our website hopefully by the end of the week. And if there are any sound problems, sorry for that, I should be able to fix that in the post video. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email. Otherwise, that is the end of the webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day.